You're listening to The Governor's Podcast, which is hosted by school governors, for school governors, and for all involved in or impacted by education governance. On The Governor's Podcast, we have open, honest, and transparent discussions about governance in the UK education sector, sharing and providing insights into the realities of entering the boardroom, sitting around the governing board table, and leaning in. Hello, I'm Sean Warmington, and as an experienced and qualified governance professional, I support schools and academies at trust and local level in driving governance excellence. I'm also the founder of the National Black Governors Network and the National Association of School and College Clerks. Collectively, with sector partners, we work with individuals and organisations seeking positive change at a strategic and operational level. Hey, it's Olivia D. Hines here, an unapologetic millennial black woman who is changing the face and space of education governance. I specialize in brand management, digital strategy, and generational diversity, bringing governance into the 21st century. I'm purpose-led and people-focused, bridging the gap between the then and the now. And you're listening to The Governor's Podcast. Okay, let's get into today's topic. So I'm super, super excited. I am always excited when we have a guest, but I am definitely excited in particular for this episode because we're leading into the not so summer, summer holidays. And we are also going to be discussing the topics of independent schools and Mm -hmm. legal expertise with our guest today, Kenji Batchelor. But just before we get into the conversation, let's roll the tape on Kenji's background. Kenji Batchelor, an education lawyer partner based in Bristol, brings a wealth of expertise in advising independent and special schools on a wide range of legal issues. Specializing in charity law, governance, corporate, commercial, and strategic matters, Kenji excels in guiding schools through complex projects such as mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, and collaborations. With over 14 years of experience serving on the boards of various education organizations and charities, Kenji has a deep understanding of the pressures faced by governors and trustees. His in-house succumbent to an international conservation charity has further honed his ability to provide legal advice within a commercial context. Kenji is renowned for his calm, practical approach and his ability to build strong client relationships. His clients appreciate his patience, courtesy, and clear communication style. Testimonials from school governors and clients highlight his invaluable support during long and complex processes, noting his knowledge, discretion, and unwavering composure. Born in Nigeria, West Africa, raised in East Asia, and educated at a British boarding school, Kenji brings a unique multicultural perspective to his work. Outside of his professional life, He enjoys spending time with his young family and is an active member of the Charity Law Association and Lawyers Christian Fellowship. So welcome, Kenji. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I met you, it seems like I've known you for a while now, but it's really a relatively short space of time. And I sort of hijacked you on the phone and said, please come on our podcast so that you can talk about all things independent school-wise. So um, welcome to our podcast, um, and we look forward to this conversation. So for our listeners, can you just give us a a brief summary of of who you are um, and your current role and um, how that fits into the the sector? Yeah, of course. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. You did spring it on me. Somewhat as a surprise and uh, as a sort of stereotypical British, um, sort of slightly emotionally uh, troubled man, I just said yes. And uh, <laughs> so, I, but I, I am delighted to be here. Um, I'm I'm a, a partner uh, in a law firm called VWV. Uh, I'm based in Bristol, but we've got some offices around the country: Birmingham, Watford, uh, London, 
and uh, and Brist- Bristol, and uh, I'm in the education team here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I specialise in advising um, independent schools, but also uh, other educational organisations, in particular in the sort of SEN special uh, needs, special schools and colleges sector. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can range from advising on governance, which uh, I think we're going to talk about today, um, but also on the more general corporate and strategic uh, matters. So um, I hope uh, that what we go through is helpful. Um, and uh, I will, uh, I'm in your hands. So <laughs> please be kind. <laughs> no, we, we're, this is definitely a safe space. Um, and Olivia and I have, have been doing this long enough to, to know that um, we don't know everything and we're always keen yeah. to learn um, ourselves. Now, my yeah. experience of independent school governance is, is limited compared to how how long I've be, been in governance. Um, and it started, I think, when my own children were were in a, an independent school, um, their first school that they that they went to. And I was on the PTA then and and had interactions with the with the board as and when. But can you just um explain for our listeners who may not know or understand um what an independent school looks like in terms of governance and then sort of go on to talk about um, how the role of a legal firm with whatever governance structure you're you're um, you're you're in um, can can maximize that yeah of course so in terms of the role of governance most independent schools are are charities Mm -hmm. in, in England and Wales not not all but most are and I think a lot of people, when they hear independent school or private school, they think of these sort of massive piles of <laughs> money, <places> like <laughs> Eaton um, yeah. and um, Bosch Boys and Bow Ties. But uh, actually, um, I think it's over half of schools, independent schools in the in the country, have fewer than uh, three hundred pupils. Mm. Um, and uh, half of those, so a quarter of all, all, school, all independent schools, have, have fewer than 200. So generally, they're, they're, they're often often small. You do get the bigger ones of you know, thousands upwards, which mm-hmm. account for about 7%. But all will be governed by uh, a board um, of charity trustees. Uh, so in, in some ways, maybe similar to some schools or mats um, in the maintained sector. Mm-hmm. Uh, they will uh, similarly be volunteers. Uh, you can technically get paid um, paid governors or paid trustees in the independent sector or in the charity sector, but very um, that it, it's a, a very very small uh, minority for very very large schools. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there are, I suppose, people like you and me, or some of your listeners who are interested in governance, who have probably been dragged onto the board by somebody they know <laughs> kicking and screaming or have some kind of professional expertise perhaps um, who uh, the, the board have reached out to. I think these days you, you get a lot more um, some more professional recruitment onto boards uh, as well, which is a good thing. We may, may talk about that sort of recruitment onto boards later. Mm-hmm. But uh, as charity trustees, they're responsible for um, the, the governance uh, and strategy of, of the school. So like uh, a lot of governance of schools, whether independent or maintained, they're looking at the the, the strategy strategy and direction uh, of the school or mm-hmm. schools if they um, own and operate more than one school, which uh, many do, uh, and making sure that they're getting the the information through from their senior leaders uh, about what's going on that they need to know about, and trying to stay out of the stuff uh, they don't need to know about. Um, so I, I was a governor. Uh, I, I've been a governor of uh, two schools, one um, a local governing body uh, of, a, of, a, of a mat um, and a, an independent school for about six plus years, I guess, sort of probably closer to sort of eight, 10 years altogether. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've sort of seen the, the joys, joys and sorrows <laughs> of, uh, of governance and uh, hopefully have uh, a few of those stories mm-hmm. to share. Uh, later on so that's that's the role of role of governance and uh sorry Sharon there was there was another question you're gonna have to stop me in this no. podcast, by the way <laughs> the lawyers have a bad reputation for 
enjoying the sound of their own voice. Although I've explained to you that I actually don't. Um, but it can be hard to stop them. No, well, well, you're you're in good company because we we tend to um do that as as well. But no, it was it was really how um, governance may differ um mm. in your experience um and also how um schools um tend to utilize um legal services um what kind of things because when you, you usually only call lawyers when you're in trouble um, <laughs> but it's understanding um you know that it's important that you have a good legal firm there um you know who can advise and not just sort out things if things go wrong um so it's really the the importance of of understanding that for our listeners in terms of the how, how governance differs i presume you mean between independent and, and Inter- maintained yes state yeah state independent sector. maintained um and is in in terms of mats i don't know i think there's one trust i know that have got independent schools within their map but their legal structure um almost like ring fences the independent schools together and ring fences the other groups so so i don't know how how do they how do they work when they join together does that then become a mat or is it just an independent independent schools that work together like a a federation may work together it it so you do get groups of schools and the way that they're structured will differ from group to group but mm-hmm. um, you know, I guess all the governance re- respon- responsibility or the accountability remains with the uh, the board at the top. Mm-hmm. But then they may delegate responsibility for you know different schools down to a uh, a sort of a, a super committee, or they may um, delegate out different aspects of governance to different committees, and those committees then have responsibility for those aspects in relation to all the schools in the group. So I suppose really, as as will be the case. Um, in the uh, in the mat in the maintain sector, it's you do you you adopt a structure that works best for you know for your um for your organisation and for for your schools. Yeah. Um. So it in in terms of how they differ, I don't think there will be sort of it's easy to say really to, in general how how it differs because governance will look different in terms of how it's structured and how people approach it from mm-hmm. from school to school. I wonder whether there's perhaps sometimes better structures in place in the maintained uh, uh, sector in terms of the um, resources that are available through MATS. So, mm-hmm. you know, they may have a professional, um, or at least on, on our local governing body, we had a professional clerk who you know, whose time was split between different boards. And so, you know, rather than the, you know, your your bursar or your financial director in the school who does everything under the sun um, and also has to know how to be a clerk to a board. In, in yeah. some, I think being in a mat, um, sometimes uh, that uh, the, the governance structure and support can, can can be can be more established. But um, I, I think in terms of legal, you were talking about you know how how we, an independent school board might go about getting legal support uh i I think it's really uh, important as with all governance matters for the the board to be clear on what they're responsible for and who does what so Mm -hmm. i think it's there are situations where it would be it would be right for a governor or a chair or whoever it is to pick up the phone to the to the lawyers but um I, i would have thought most matters Unless they're specifically governance related, will be dealt with you know, by by a, a head or a bursa, and you know you want your senior leadership to be really comfortable about the access they have mm-hmm. and uh, to be able to get early help. I um, mean, that's sort of an educational phrase, but um, in legal terms, it also works. I, I think you know if you can get some early support and uh, have an early call with a with a lawyer um, in in my experience, as you say, you're you're usually calling up because there's a problem. Um, very few people call me up just to have a chat, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> yes, so so this is you know this is this is lovely this conversation. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, if you can get an an early steer, very often it it can help avoid a bigger issue arising. Mm-hmm. I think it's not. But realistically, it's not, that's not always possible. But that will mm. certainly be one of my tips 
Um, uh, Sharon, I think you were mentioning before we we started that. You know, in your role, you often find that that's helpful to get a get have an. Early oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. As as a governance professional, head of governance and, and and company secretary, the first thing almost before I even take on a new contract is I want to know who your legal firm um, are. Um, you know, because I want to know that I've got that um, backup. Um, of help because often as the governance professional especially in a trust situation everybody comes to you and expect you to know everything when you know you can't know everything and and most governance professionals um, in the sector are not legally trained um, you know so so it's important that we have that legal um, um, backer and, you know, just thinking about complaints, complaints are on the rise. Um, uh, parental complaints are, you know, one of the the, the big things um, going on at the moment in the sector. And I myself, you know, have almost had um, weekly calls or emails to um, the, the, the legal representatives just to um, have them as a sounding board to say, you know, this is what I think we should do in terms of responding to this um, to the, to this um, message. Is this okay? Because you know nobody wants to 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 create something that then legally is going to cause a problem. So I think it's important that that governors understand um, that that what I would call scaffolding. Um, you know, you've got your internal stakeholders as governors. You understand but also your external stakeholders who create that scaffolding around the school, um, those, those key organisations and providers that can, that can support the school in times of need is important. And um, I will say that um, I hadn't heard of VWV, but your reputation in the sector is very strong because the moment I put it out into the governance professionals network to say I'm looking for a legal firm for an independent school, um, then your company was the one that was um, flagged the most. Um, so, so you know, and it's important that we have that um, those kind of referrals because you don't want to go in cold and have to start from scratch and explain to somebody, you know, the setting or the context in which you're you're in. So having somebody who knows what they're talking about and talking about that, we um, the project that we're currently working on together is is an international school um, mm -hmm. that um, is in the UK. Um, I won't mention the name, but um, how do international schools, in your experience, differ from, um, I'll say, traditional UK schools in terms of governance that you may be aware of? I've got my own take on it, but um, it'll be interesting to know yours. Uh, yeah, that's it. So there, I mean, there are lots of different shapes and sizes of international schools. Um, and uh, I think what we... The, the most interesting are, are those which are sort of truly sort of they're, they're sort of little they're little satellites of yeah. you know, their country of origin and yeah. and when you walk in it's like you walk out of England and into <laughs> you know, wherever it is and yes. you know it's a really special thing to have created that for very often you know expats who are mm -hmm. working in the in the UK and they want their child to um you know let's uh, let's for argument's sake say Nigeria, you know, wants yeah. their child to grow up with a Nigerian, you know, part, part of that it, it, within yeah. them in their education so that, you know, if they were to, if they were to return, you know, they, they have not fallen behind or lost, you know, lost that part of them and their, and, and their family. Yeah. I think for schools of, of that kind of, um, that, that kind of nature, it, it's, it, it can be really challenging because very often the pool of governors, your, um, you're sort of fishing from, as it were, uh, are, it, it is a very small one in terms of those who will be sort of naturally interested in in helping in, with with that school's governance. It will be you know parents of children at the school, or you know perhaps people from the local community mm -hmm. of a you know Nigerian heritage or Nigerian companies in the UK, for example, um, and uh, they will bring a a mindset 
from their country and culture uh, mm-hmm. and apply that to you know a very English way of uh, gov- English um, sort of structure uh, of governance. And that can sometimes create uh, uh, challenge- challenges, I think is probably the best way of, uh, of putting it. Mm-hmm. So, um, a- and yet at the same time, you know, you can't take that culture out of them uh, or just expect that, you know, everyone on your board is going to miraculously, you know, just adopt and sort of just uh, take in English Englishness um, yeah. into into themselves when they you know walk into a, a room or sign on to a Teams meeting and have a have a have a governor's um, governor's meeting or this discussion. So I, I think training is is, uh, is is sort of almost essential for, mm-hmm. for those kinds of organisations because you know they're bringing all the value and experience of their you know their own background but perhaps they haven't trained like you said you know Sharon as uh, as governance experts maybe don't have experience of governance in the UK or if they do you know in a very perhaps more of a corporate context rather than a yes um education or, or charitable context so but um at the same time you know very selfishly as a lawyer I, I think it's fascinating you know getting to know people and how they look view things differently how they take different kinds of how they take decisions differently Mm -hmm. i think it's very easy as governance advisors to think there's one way of doing it you know there's there's one bit bit of guidance there's one paradigm that works and you know you will comply you 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 Mm -hmm. must comply with what with (laughs) what we say um but actually you know even within our, our our own um school schools we have schools who you know, come from different cultures and backgrounds so mm. you know for the, the famous one which those you know who who are more involved with governance will know of is um quakers uh and quaker oh, yeah. way of dis- making decisions is um enormously different different from you know the oh, way wow. other schools uh or, or you know religious organization organizations would take decisions and, and perhaps in many ways more akin to you know some other cultures than mm-hmm. um than we realize and actually can work you know can work remarkably remarkably well um i, I think the, the sort of the british form of governance seems to it, it, it seems to i think perhaps encourage those with the biggest mouths um who, who make the most noise um mm-hmm. whereas actually some uh, some other cultures you know their their way of doing governance will um will, will be very very different and you know you don't want to lose that um uh, but at the same time i suppose we you know we want to learn learn from others and um Absolutely. Uh, part of being in the the framework the, the legal and regulatory framework in the uk is i, I suppose learning learning the language um uh, so that when you get a regulator coming in or uh you know, a question asked about you know how you're making decisions, and someone wants to know that you can you can understand it. And 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 I think, in fairness, that that is that is challenging, and, and yeah. it takes more time and effort for perhaps those organisations. But hopefully, one that is uh, is well worth it. Yeah, wow. I, um, it it just makes me um think about just governance generally, and um, I'm corporate governance trained, so what the way in which I um make it work in my mind is whatever sector I'm in I sort of find out exactly what the governance codes and the governance frameworks are for that sector and apply the principles um to the work that I'm doing so you know what I found with the school that we're working with um on this project is understanding the the culture first and foremost but also the way in which they like to work and then finding out that they're regulated by Ofsted and that they're under the independent school standards and then marrying the two so that you're not diminishing the culture and the and the practice and the way they want to work but you're making sure that governance wise it is complying with what is necessary mm-hmm. and it's similar to again the way um, you know, I believe that schools um, in mainstream or whether it's in the Church of England 
left or, you know, I don't know um, in terms of the, the, the Quakers. I've never looked at that that um, model um, really, but, but any kind of setting, I always think about your statutory obligations, um, which is a must, um, what governance looks like within the organisation or the trust you're in, so what you should do. Um, in relation to this is the way we, we we do things here. And then anything that falls out of those first two, what then falls into just good governance practice. Um, and I think once we've sort of covered those three areas, then you're likely to be on track um, as, a, as a good governor or a good governance professional, um, you know, um, supporting the, the, the school and the children that you're that you're working with. I'm going to um, pause there and um, take a break to hear from our lovely sponsors, Governor Hub. We know that you lead busy lives outside of being a governor or a trustee. You're volunteering to make a difference so that every child receives the education they deserve, whatever their circumstance. Here at Governor Hub, we want to make governance as easy as possible for you, so that you can focus on what matters, having an impact. That's why with Governor Hub, you'll find everything you need to manage governance effectively all in one place. From the board tools in Governor Hub that allow you to manage all of your meetings, documents and the work of your board, to the guidance, resources and training in Governor Hub Knowledge that gives you and your fellow volunteers everything you need to be effective from day one. We work with more than two thirds of schools in England to support great governance. Find out more at governorhub.com and if you want to stay connected to the wider community of governors and trustees, go to thehoot.news. <music> Welcome back. And I feel like this is the first time you're actually hearing my voice since the intros, which we just talked about on our break. Um, we are always having first here on our podcast. And this was the first time of the two hosts, you only heard one. <laughs> and so it was, it's quite amusing that Kenji now feels like I'm a quiet person, uh, which for anyone who, who knows me knows I'm the complete opposite. You are not so, that. <laughs> so thank you for um, a very refreshing view of myself, Kenji. I definitely, definitely appreciate that. But it was a really rich dialogue. And so I guess it kind of links to um, something that I am working on. And it just happened to manifest in this conversation um, this year in terms of my listening skill. And I spent the first half really listening to, you know, the questions that Sharon was asking, but also the responses and the the very wise information that you gave Kenji because you touched on so many different things that resonate with me you mentioned in your opening about your focuses around send which is an area that I am exploring a bit more to really understand um you talked about independent schools not having as many differences to maintain schools than what one that the average person would would um actually think about which was really eye-opening for me because when when you are only in one setting for so long you can often feel like any other setting is completely different but to have someone else in a completely different setting, talk about that space. And you're like, oh, there's a lot more similarities than I realized. And I feel like that very, very much speaks to humanity as well. You can look at someone and everything about them externally is different to you. But when you actually sit down and have a conversation, you realize that there's actually so much overlap in your life experiences and your belief system and the way that you think and the way that you feel, but it all comes down to ensuring that you open the doors to those conversations and you communicate authentically so that you can learn about other people. And then you bring that diversity of perspective and, and visibility to the space. So there were so many things that were happening in the first half of this episode. Maybe I wasn't supposed to speak. That's how I, how I see things. I wasn't supposed to speak. I was supposed to listen and really think about 
how we can move this conversation forward in this second half. And so I wanted to ask a question. I appreciate that this wasn't necessarily a question we outlined in the beginning. So I hope it doesn't put you too much on the spot, Kenji. But something that really started to fire around in my brain as you were talking is how you are experienced in the legal space, but you support schools as a, um, a, a lawyer. But then when you think about people who bring that skill set as a governor, so if you were to be a governor and you're sitting around the table and you have legal experience, I, I think my question is around how do you switch one off, switch one on, meaning if a question or uh, a situation comes up that requires legal expertise, what stops people from looking at the person that they know is a lawyer in the room who is actually sat in that seat as a governor, not as the legal representation for the school, if that makes sense? I feel like sometimes mm -hmm. there's an expectation that because you are a lawyer and you come in as a school governor with legal expertise, you're supposed to be able to answer all the legal questions and solve all the legal situations that a school goes through, but you're not there to fulfill the lawyer role. So how does a how does a lawyer switch that on and off? You have the skill set, which is of value, so you can offer strategic insight and oversight, but it is not your place to be a lawyer in that seat, in that meeting? Does that does that question make sense? It does. I, I'm really glad. I think you've sort of answered it for me, uh, oh. Olivia. I mean, the answer, the first thing you asked, I think, was sort of what stops people looking at you as, you know, the, the font for knowledge? And the answer is nothing. Nothing stops them. Everyone will look at you. You know, you're, any, anyone who's listening who's got expertise in whatever area it is, safeguarding or, you know, well, you know, well-being or marketing mm. or business or finance or accounting or whatever it is and something comes that comes up which is vaguely you know related to them everyone of course will immediately look to them for their view and there's something very good about that in that you know it shows that the board have been sensible enough to uh, uh to to ask to join their board somebody with mm. you know expertise in whatever area it is and you know if, if most schools I'm sure will be reviewing having, having a sort of skills audit of who's on the board and making sure that the, you know all the key areas of governance and education and things that go on at the school can be covered if possible uh, by someone um, knowledgeable uh, uh, in in those areas not always possible of course but um yeah, I think, yeah, you answered in terms of what, what you do, do you switch it off, switch it on, switch it off? Like you said, um, Lev, I think the answer is, you, you know, you're not an advisor in that situation. Yeah. If you've been, um, if you've been appointed as a, as a governor, appointed as a trustee, you're, you're a trustee um, and you're part of that collective decision making that you're responsible for. So, um, you know, it does start blurring the lines if you're advising and making decisions uh, uh as well and so um I, I think i've always tried to to take a step back and sort of flag issues that i think we need answers to but not necessarily advise on those answers right um because you know i think it's for for the school itself to get the advice that it needs from its advisors mm -hmm. who are mm -hmm. um who are acting independently and uh also uh, critically insured <laughs> to give that <laughs> advice which you know I'm not in my role as a as a trustee mm. so I I think it's being clear uh not panicking I think it's very easy to think you know as, as an expert in a certain field I've, I've got to get this right or you know I'm gonna, I'm, it's going to be so embarrassing mm. if I you know if, if I can't do this myself mm. but um I think you know first of all remembering the uh the duty of collective decision making you know and it's not your role to uh make a decision all on your own um yeah. if people aren't clear about what you know what the issues are you should get they should you know they should get advice and it's not appropriate for them to get advice from you mm -hmm. just because you're you know you know whatever it is about safeguarding or you know something legal or property related etc mm -hmm. um 
And uh, uh, but all of that said, um, I think for some people, you know, it will be helpful to hear that actually, as in charity law, at least, you know, as a trustee, you're you're expected to bring your, mm-hmm. you know, your experience and expertise to the table. But if you're not, you know, I'm not an employment lawyer. I can't bring employment law expertise to the table mm-hmm. as much as everyone yeah. around the board table would like like me to say something about <laughs> it. I, I you know I, I just can't. And you yeah. know, there's no expectation that you would um, bring that. But if it was something related to, you know, governance or, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, mergers and acquisitions and, and things like that that I do from day to day. And similarly for anyone else, you know, he's, he's a professional who brings their, you know, brings another life and part, part of their experience and expertise uh, into a meeting, then it's, you know, it's, it's brilliant that they can do that. And, um, you know, they should, they should share that. Um, but uh, again, sort of not, not, act, not, not acting adv- as advisor, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Um, as part of the, uh, sort of, governs decision making and and fact finding and uh hopefully that will have to helps create a, a a clearer line between their roles I hear that I hear that that's that's such a helpful helpful response and and a legal take but I guess you could swap out legal for as you say um any other skill set that you have in your everyday um, working life so whether that is HR or whether that is um, finance and accountancy or risk or whether it's to do with safeguarding whether you're an educationalist I feel like that is a a blurred line sometimes if you are an educationalist if you are a teacher or a senior leader in one school and then you're a governor in another mm-hmm. school I guess it can be it can be an internal battle sometimes to know when when do I just focus on being a governor here or and or do I need to bring in the fact that I know that this is this is what's coming down the pipeline or this is how school should be run but you've got to also recognize that every school is different and so whilst you may be a teacher in one setting or a leader in in one setting the way that you govern in this other setting may need to be shaped and molded based on the context that you're in and so what I heard from you when you were talking about what type of law you specialize in that you have expertise in, it's knowing not only the limitations of your knowledge, but the boundaries of your role as well. And knowing that you can show up authentically and you still, and you can ask certain questions because of your expertise. But as you say, you can't be on both sides of the table. Mm -hmm. You can't be the person who is doing, making the operation, taking the operational action and also offering strategic decisions uh, or advice or um, suggestions or questioning. So, so I definitely feel that's helpful, but something you just mentioned towards the tail end of what you said, you mentioned the words mergers and acquisitions, which you don't often hear in education, (laughs) or at least from my experience um, working within maintained schools, you hear it often in a corporate setting. So I would like to just kind of pivot into that language because uh, Sharon and yourself spoke earlier in the second half, in the first half about um, language. And as you were talking, it made me think about you know, when you go on holiday, you try and learn key words of the, the language of the culture that you're entering so that you can have more effective communication with the things that you then need. And I see that in education as well. We always talk about how education has its own language, but then there's now even further dialects, if you want, if you want to say that, from how independent schools may speak versus how schools are part of a map may speak versus how schools that are maintained schools or faith-based schools may speak. So in terms of um, mergers, what legal and strategic considerations should governors be aware of when their school is contemplating or considering a merger or collaboration with another institution? Wow, that's a big question. Um, (laughs) So, I I mean, of course, there are... uh, from a legal point of view, there are mergers in the maintained sector. You need you talked about mats, mats and multi academy trusts. There's lots of academies all sort of squashed together into one. And and mm-hmm. you know from a legal point of view, though you know those are often you know you could see them as as mergers in the independent sector. 
it's exactly it's um it, it, they're often very similar similar ways of structuring um schools into um into an into a legal entity and there will be different reasons um as to why you know that may be the right thing for your for your school uh it's there are it, it's a it's quite a challenging time for independent schools most people will, uh, in education um whether you're in the independent sector or not may have read a little bit about you know the the labor party's proposal to raise um raise money for the maintained sector um uh, by uh re- removing the uh VAT exemption for independent schools and possibly changing um, in some way the charitable status of mm. the charities that operate um, independent schools. <laughs> so lots of governing. We're 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 talking to uh, lots and lots of boards and senior leaders in independent schools at the moment who are looking at you know, potentially uh, a twenty percent rise, or you know up, up to you know it won't be twenty percent, but uh, you know the, the exemption is twenty percent an extra 20 percent or 15 percent for, for their parents mm. um and wondering you know what what changes that will make uh to to their charity and to yeah. to what they're wanting to do um and mergers uh sort of strategic options are should be on the table for for most if not all boards as to you know are there are there benefits from being uh, in a as part of a bigger bigger group, you know, is it is it better to be um, stronger together, or actually, will are we stronger um, on our own? And there's definitely, uh, I mean, it's been a long, um, long-standing trend, probably that the sector is much harder for smaller um, independent uh, schools. There are some, you know, big schools who are on their own who can ride you know ride the waves that are coming <laughs> but for excuse me for the smaller schools you know there's, there's a huge trend of, of mergers where they are um uh, joining joining sort of families as it were of schools together a bit very, very much like a mat and saying you know we can have you know a really professional well-resourced sort of back office team and board of governors uh and we can you know, we can be more efficient together. We can um, secure uh, a sort of a feed of pupils through our through our group of schools. Um, we can share facilities, um, and uh, you know, there could be lots of exciting things we can do together, which we can't do uh, on our own. So, yeah, lots of schools are are, are looking at that strategically. Um, there are some schools who can look at that um, in a more a uh, positive uh, way and say, well, you know, this, this might be a wonderful thing for us. Let's let's see what opportunities are there, and if, if anybody would be willing to have a, a conversation. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there are some schools for whom you know that it's it, it's at the end of the road for them unless somebody comes and essentially sort of helps helps them out. So mm. yeah, we we deal with um sort of everything on the on the spectrum there, um and. Uh, also in the independent sector, you know, there are some very successful and respected corporate groups uh, as well. So for profit companies who are <laughs> uh, buying schools uh, and um, either they're buying them around to turn them around or just, you know, building a group and, and running them very successfully. And uh, I, I think with the removal of the, of the VAT uh, exemption, and you know, possible removal of the benefits of charitable status for in the independent schools, which aren't for profit, you know, they will be on a level of pr- playing field with some of these for, for profit groups, or you know, in, in some cases, you might say uh, at a sort of tactical or strategic disadvantage because mm-hmm. they've not got any advantages from being a charity and also have to follow all the charity law rules uh, as well. So it's going to be, I think there's some big changes coming down the road for, mm-hmm. for independent schools um, and there'll be a lot more consolidation, schools coming together. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, parents um, are and families are going to continue to want choice for their yes. children. And mm-hmm. um, I don't think that's going to change. 
you know, I think there will be small, small schools which unfortunately fail or have to close. Mm. Um, but, you know, we, we would hope that the schools which for which there's demand and which provide, you know, a fantastic education um, and which is seen as a, a you know, a, a better option for some some families and their and their children, uh, you know, they, they will they will continue. Um, and, you know, I, th- I think I think the that there are uh people are saying you know perhaps the sector will shrink by up to 10 percent um mm-hmm. that that may well happen but um yeah i, I think the, the the mission of independent schools will remain the same as it is in the maintained sector of educating and looking after yeah. uh, the young people who who are in their care so mm-hmm. um you know as advisors it's you know, we we can sort of sit slightly away from it in our ivory towers, but actually, you know, many of us, many of us are governors, yeah, um, and uh, you know, he- heavily invested in in the schools who we who we look after. So it's um, yeah, it's going to be a tough time, but um, I think you know, one where you know, working together will be you know, it will be critical, whether that's through mergers or whether that's c- through collaborations, mm-hmm. um, and you know, it, it, and if that's you know, part of what the challenges down the road bring, you know, I think it will make for a uh, hopefully for a stronger sector that comes out of it uh, the other side i love that, is, that. Yeah. yeah i mean you you sound um like you speak my language the language of optimism i always try and be realistic with the way that i enter or I exist in the space but always have a very optimistic view of what could happen or how this challenge can create uh, a positive ripple effect because i think it's it's Dare I say it, and that would probably be um probably be a statement that pe- many disagree with, but I find it so easy to be negative and 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 be down in the dumps about all the things that are happening. And it takes a lot of courage to really be able to shine a light on it and say, okay, the the landscape isn't pretty, or there are when I think of back to my um business student days, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, there are a lot of threats. But there are also some opportunities that we can capitalize on and, and, and leverage on leverage from. And so what you what you spoke about in terms of the governance landscape, the education landscape, the societal landscape, um, it, it's it's real. It's real today in terms of the size of schools. And I, I particularly like the fact that you that you mentioned sometimes strength is standing on your own it's just trying to recognize or find out what what strength looks like for your setting for your school sometimes it is joining with someone else and other times it is seeing that you you have um strength or you're very strong where you are and you can you can project forward and see that that is sustainable and so I think if anything I would hope that um this conversation triggers any listeners to to have the conversation if your school is not already talking about what's going to happen in the next three to five years then now is the time now Mm -hmm. is always the time and you don't have to be a governor who has sat on the board for 10 years or five years or 12 months to bring it up you could be a governor who joined yesterday and you are asking the question today because it's a conversation that may be uncomfortable, but it's something that is better had in advance than you um, end up having to to figure things out once once things are already in motion. And so um, I definitely value what you shared there, um, what you shared there, Kenji, because it's definitely opened up my mind, not least because the things I hear about is like things like birth rates. And so if there's less children, in certain areas, then that could be a reason why there's less children to fill our schools. And so that could lead to why schools are closing down. It's all these everyday things, the generations are shifting, which is a which is an area that I specialize in, in terms of speaking about how time and, and experiences change in 10 and 15 year blocks. Um, and we do need to think like that because it's 2024, it will be 2025 in less than six months. And many of us can remember 2000 and 2000 was 24, 25 years ago. So 15 years from now, isn't actually that far away if you can remember the last 25 years. So it's really just thinking of time in the now, in the present 
so that we actually have a future when when we move forward. Um, yeah, I, I, I think really it can be quite legal. scary for some governors yeah. thinking about mm. the strategy. And mm. um, I think it's, you know, podcasts like this give people a uh, uh, an opportunity to hear other people, yeah. um, you know, share their share the challenges um of of government so I, I think this is a great thing and and there's lots of resources out there um i think not everyone feels comfortable talking about yeah. strategy it's, for some you know it can feel a little um this uh, remote and mm-hmm. sort of pie in the sky mm-hmm. but um you know just as you know you talked about when do you go when do you get legal advice um you know you get you get the advice when you're not sure what the answer is you know when you need yeah. help and you've not got yes. the expertise it's part and parcel of your duty as a, a trustee or a governor and, and the charity commission says so to get the help you need mm-hmm. and Absolutely. so that can include strategy consultants um, mm-hmm. you know we have a an educational strategy consultancy as part of our you know family of of, of businesses and, and and services and there are you know many of your listeners who are in the independent sector will know of several sector specific um, strategy consultants who can, who can help you mm-hmm. know, if they if they feel they're just you know um, grassing around in the dark and yeah. just as you would pay to get good legal expertise where you're you know you're going to pay in other ways if you don't same thing mm-hmm. with strategy you know it's yeah. worth the investment it's, it's worth investing in mm. if you don't have that expertise yeah. on on your board and it's not something to be embarrassed about because strategy is you know is challenging just you know just as all many all aspects of running schools yeah um you know they they are complicated yeah and highly regulated um yeah. highly regulated things so um it's definitely not to feel you're you're on your own and then, mm-hmm. and there's lots of help uh, mm-hmm. out there and if if people if people want to reach out to me or you know if, if there's something that they want uh, help with I'm very happy to point them in there in the, in the right direction um because we yeah we, we know lot, we have lots of friends in the sector who do di- sort of help help with different different aspects of governance um or the running of schools absolutely and i can i can testify to um you know the the webinars and the resources that vwv mm-hmm. have got available um for those in the sector um which often governing boards don't are not aware of internally operationally we tend to be aware of what we need to do um but i think it's important that governors themselves know and understand the resources that are available to them as well so um but it, uh, this conversation has just reminded me of why i actually made the decision to send you olivia to um a, a, a private school and it wasn't because you know, it was a private school. Um, It was because at the time, sorry, the cat's on my keyboard. (laughs) For those listening, Sharon is currently being attacked. Being attacked um, by the cat. cat. Our listeners have definitely got several firsts today. (laughs) At the time when when, um, we made the decision, it was out of necessity, really. Um, And I think just um, when you were talking about, you know, what this government... Um, is looking to do and you know the VAT that's being applied to to independent schools and the and the shrinking of of independent schools I personally think it will be a shame um that may not be um what I should be saying as somebody who works a lot in the state um in the in the in the state school sector but I think options are important for individuals um, you know, having the option of choosing where your child is educated for whatever reason, um, I think is 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 very um, important, um, and that's why for me, I would still um, like to see the independent the independent sector um, thrive. I do think there should be a sharing of wealth, but not everybody in independent schools comes from that wealth background and if you've got schools of you know 300 and less or or less pupils their budgets won't be that high because you can only charge so much um you know you can only charge so much and they will still be having to juggle budgets and and have to pay staff and do all the things that are necessary um but above all um you know governance is the is 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 the is the key and if those schools are being run effectively 
and and correctly and um, meeting their compliance obligations, then let them ride is my is my take on that. <laughs> let them ride. I hear that. I hear that. There, there are so many nuggets that have come out of this conversation, which I um, really appreciate. And we've we've spoken about independent schools. We've spoken about international schools, which is something I didn't even anticipate that we would we would really touch on in a way in a way to really expand people's minds on the fact that governance really is everywhere. We talked we talked about this in um, a, a couple of episodes ago about governance being in your everyday life and so if you think of every different type of school that exists um whether you are in it or not it will have its own governance flavor dare i say it and so it's how we um can share knowledge share expertise share thinking um i definitely appreciate what you said kenji about this podcast being a resource that people can tap into to really hear different perspectives and have a new um a new idea added to the mix of the ideas that people already have or the spaces that they are already in and so just widening that consideration so I feel like this is a, a perfect time to really think about our takeaways because we've spoken about so much and I'm quite a reflective person I'm always taking moments to reflect at key milestones on my journey. And so I feel like in this conversation, it will be good to, to kind of get a sense of what each of us as individuals here may do moving forward or what we had never really thought about before this conversation. But our takeaways, I know, also offers our listeners an opportunity to think, OK, what did I just listen to? And how has it been useful to me? What can I, um, how, where can I plant a seed to move forward uh, with other people? So if we start with, with yourself, Sharon, and then we can, um, we can then have Kenji and then I'll wrap up. Well, I, I wrote my um, takeaway down um, probably 10 minutes in. Um, and it was when Kenji said, um, um, adapt a structure that works best. And I think that, um, you know, is really, really important that any governor in any situation understands that um, irrespective of what we need to do, um, you know, um, because of it, it's a statutory requirement, um, when you are in your local setting, even if you are part of a bigger organisation, understand that the children within that setting are different. Um, so even if all your trust are, are secondary or all of your school are primary, the children in your school are different to the school down the road. Um, and so adapting um, a structure that works best for the children in your school will always be the priority in my mind. So that's my takeaway. Brilliant. Kenji, what's your takeaway? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not currently uh, a governor, for which I'm quite grateful, but um, if, <laughs> if I were, um, I mean, I think I'd be feeling really challenged to um, get on top of school strategy because more than ever, it's really critical and such a challenging time for schools. I think uh, it's important to grasp that nettle now and not feel um, not feel embarrassed if it's not not your thing and um, know that it's something everyone is lots of schools are struggling with but yeah. don't you know don't bury your heads uh in, in the sand um it's your it's your responsibility um and uh you know don't be afraid to ask the stupid question and ask what your strategy is mm -hmm. and um and uh and, and own it and uh to to feel the i think assurance of knowing that we do have we do have a plan we do have a direction um we've taken advice and talk to people who know about it if we're not sure and um yeah to to sort of to own the that own the responsibility over, over the school strategy i think will be a, re a really important part of uh, of governance in, in the next 12 uh, 24 months i hear that i hear that thank Absolutely. you yeah i thank you my takeaway is something a word that was said at the beginning and then towards the end, repeated towards the end of the conversation, and it is the word help. And I think it really does lead on from what you've just shared, Kenji, about 
when you recognize that there is something that you do not have, but you need it in order to move forward, ask for help. And this is in your professional life. This is in your personal life. This is at work. This is at home. And this is actually something that has taken me years to get comfortable with asking for help. And I just really hope that each individual, each organization really hears that because it's so important because you you do not have to isolate yourself. You do not have to alienate yourself. And you actually may find that by asking for help, you realize that you're not the only one who's also got that question or also got that problem or also got that issue that could um, benefit from someone who is ex- uh, an expert or experienced in, in, in that area. And I feel like asking for help is on the back of listening and being able to to know what's going on around you or listen to what other people are asking. I, I, I found this myself as a governor, that, that those first 12 months of being a new governor, I listened. I just, I never, I didn't necessarily ask many questions. I had to first listen to those around so that I can then know how I could be of assistance or I could be of value to that space. And then now I'm in a position where I'm able to say, okay, we need help in this area. Do we have that structure in place? And I know new governors coming in are now listening to the questions I'm asking. So it's a cycle. You have to first, sometimes you have to be that first person to do something in order for other people to see that it's okay to do it. And so I definitely have learned a lot here um and I do go back to the point where I, I I felt like I was supposed to listen in that first half just really like um get a bit of CPD myself today on a Wednesday as we're recording it um so I'd like to say a huge thank you to you to yourself Kenji because you have given me a perspective of independent schools um a different one to what I've experienced because as Sharon was saying her children went to a private school but that was when I was in my infant year. So I was, it was like, I don't know what, three, four until the age of 11 and I'm 30 now. So I actually don't remember a lot about being a student there, let alone the governance there. Mm. But I feel like I have now been exposed to um, a a different way, a different lens of um, independent and private school. So if ever I wanted to volunteer in one at a strategic level, mm-hmm. I feel like I can I can offer something. So I definitely um, am grateful for your wisdom and the, the experiences that you shared um, and the journey that you're on yourself as you go through experiences. And whilst you may not be a governor and you're, I feel like you you're taking some comfort in that given the landscape we're in, you mentioned earlier that you're a trustee. And so that is still a very important role um, and all the other things that you do. Um, so thank you. And I'm, uh, I'll also, yeah, of course, of course. And I know that you said that if people did want to get in touch with you, they can. So I know you're on LinkedIn because I'm connected with you on LinkedIn. So if anyone wants to, <laughs> if anyone wants to connect with Kenji, then you can find him on LinkedIn but also we will put in the description box of the episode um, Kenji's details if you wanted to reach out for your legal expertise um, in um, the independent schools field or any other fields that you cover. So thank you again. And we look thank forward you. to speaking to you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Both. I, can, I, can I just say there's people are worried about being charged talking to a lawyer. We've got, we've got lots of free resources <laughs> on our website. Yeah. You um, have loads of free have. resources for on governance on schools, both independent and uh, maintained mats. Uh, there are free documents. Um, you can sign up for free updates, legal updates, yeah. and yeah. and webinars. And uh, you know, we uh, I, I don't bite, so please please do get in touch. Um, it's yeah. uh, it's always nice to speak to people in the in the sector. So thank you so much, um, both for uh, for having me on. Of course. Yep. That, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Please rate, review and subscribe via your preferred streaming platform. 
The Governor's Podcast is a brand of the legal entity Education Governance Solutions Limited and a free training resource for anyone. So if you know someone who is interested in becoming a governor or a trustee, please share this podcast with them. And if you'd like to get in touch with us directly with questions or comments, then drop us an email at thegovernorspodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on social media platforms at The Governor's Podcast. Let's connect.